Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Matt Jarvis. I'm the uh, chief strategist from 72 and Sunny. I'm here with John Boiler, who's the president and uh, one of the co-founders of 72 and Sunny. Uh, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with our company, we are um, based in Los Angeles and Amsterdam. Our, our mission is to um, create brave ideas that inspire passion in people. Uh, we do that for a um, series of, of multinational clients, including HP, Nike, Activision, uh, a recent relationship with Fiat, and probably of the work that has been out um, in the last couple months that has shown here in Europe, uh, we, we recently authored the 2011 Just Do It campaign for Nike, which involved action sports called The Chosen. And um, we're here to talk today about company and culture. Uh, before we get in, we just want to tell you a little bit about ourselves. I joined 72 and Sunny three years ago uh, as a partner and chief strategy officer. Prior to that, I ran strategy for Deutsch, uh, which is an agency in, um, in the United States. And then prior to that, I was a telecom entrepreneur uh, in which I had um, great <laughs> success and, and epic failures, uh, which have prepared me well for a career in advertising. Um, so that's me, John. So uh, yeah, I'm John Boiler. I was one of the co-founders of 72 and Sunny. And um, prior to that, uh, I worked for 11 years at Wyden and Kennedy, both in Portland starting in 1991 and then moved over to Amsterdam to run that office with a couple other guys in 1998. And um, you know, one of the reasons why we, we offered up uh, this subject, uh, thanks by the way for showing up for it today, um, was because you know, we, we have a lot of passion as new entrepreneurs starting out an advertising agency. We have a lot of passion for uh, great beginnings and, and how to make a culture that not only produces great work, um, but produces great people. And um, you know, a lot of places talk in their mission statements about the work, um, but as you know, young professionals as in this room, it's really important to take stock of the environment that you put yourself in. And um, that's what we really want to talk to you about today because uh, you know, we've been fortunate enough to uh, be shaped well for success into the future and hopefully some of the stuff that we've got to share with you today can help uh, guide you into a place that you're really strongly positioned for success in the future. So before we jump in here, I just want to get a sense of who we're talking to. Uh, how many people here don't work in advertising yet but want to work in advertising? Let me see some hands. Okay, a few. How many people here currently work in advertising? Okay, a lot more. Um, how many people here uh, think that they still have room to grow in their career? Okay, we better see everybody on that one. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Um, growth, personal growth, is the fundamental to what we believe to be um, both a successful and gratifying career. And, and what we want to talk about are um, how the cultures that you associate with and help build uh, impact that growth for you personally. So the most important career decision you can make if growth is part of your value system. You want to ask him? Is, oh, I'm yeah. I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, OK, that's a good, good, good call. Um, anyone, anyone have any, any personal uh, op opinions on what the most important career decision you can make right now? Anybody? We're not saying we got the right answer, so. We have an opinion, but <laughs> yeah. you, know, you may disagree, and that's, that'd be great. Yes? Reputation management. Reputation management, good. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's a big one. Who to work with, absolutely. Mm. Anyone else? Those are two yeah. good ones. Those are good. Okay. Yeah. Who's looking out for you and teaching you? Yes. Not to Not, be labeled. Yeah, don't be labeled. Yes. Great. Who you are. Yeah. yeah all right. <laughs> Fundamental. <laughs> and who you want to be. Yeah. Not being afraid of anything. Not being afraid of anything. Yes. We're going to get along. <laughs> <laughs> 
Learn continuously. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Challenge mainstream. It's always interesting trying to define what mainstream is. It keeps moving. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Okay, so an opinion. Don't be an asshole. <laughs> Don't be an asshole. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but a lot of uh, a lot of those things are going to be shaped by the culture that you throw yourself into. So are you going to be afraid? Well, if the culture teaches you to be afraid, you will. Um, do they reward courage and bravery or, or not? Um, are there a bunch of assholes running it? <laughs> it's likely that you will learn to be one. <laughs> so that's why we wanted to talk about this a little bit today. And we have an expression in our joint, and it's the name of our internal newsletter. Um, Culture People Culture was coined by employee number one, who was an elementary school teacher who came to be our first assistant to help us set up the shop when we didn't have a garbage service picking up garbage and it was getting smelly. Um, and is now running our biggest account. Yes. <laughs> and is destined to take both of our jobs <laughs> soon. Um, you want to do this? Yeah, sure. So. Um, so when we say culture, people, culture, it, it, it's based on a belief that um, if you work at a place with a healthy culture that you're connected with, that your personal growth will be healthy, um, the company's growth will be healthy, and that you will be in a context that propels you forward. And that for as powerful as any individual is, we are cultural creatures. We are deeply affected by the environments, and we spend so much time in our jobs. We are deeply impacted and shaped by the environments that we're in. So um, what we wanted to do with growth as a theme is identify what our experience and our opinions are, and we really, would really love to have a conversation about this, about what are the key values of a culture that you might look for um, to find the best possible environment for your growth. So I just want to caveat this, by the way. I mean, obviously, this is our point of view. It is not necessarily the end all and be all of things. And we're not trying to sell you on the 72 and sunny way or program you in any ways. Um, as a matter of fact, this is open for debate. And we welcome that because we are courageous people. <laughs> There you go. All right, so um, we're going to talk about each of these. Collaboration, generosity, courage, accountability, and ambition. All right, so um, first of all, collaboration. Um, if, if, if Collaboration is so important, particularly at earlier stages of your career, because in the absence of a collaborative environment and a collaborative value system, chances are the idea that wins is the idea that comes from the person at the top of the organization. Um, and while that can be nice for the people at the top of the organization, as you're rising and growing, I imagine, and you should be, seeking environments where you can make the maximum impact as an individual and as a creative talent. And that's going to be a place where collaboration is an important part of the value system. Um, the Places that value collaboration tend not to be about the person. They tend to be best, idea, best damn idea wins environments, um, which is an inherently superior place to be at the earlier stages of your career. So what we're hoping to, you know, like, again, there's just some opinions about how you might be able to recognize that. Because, you know, none of us are probably done in our careers evaluating the kind of place that we're either going to join or create. Um, so these are some touchstones for us that, you know, we recognize when we're in balance and out of balance on this collaboration thing. Um, and how do you recognize that you're, this is a culture of collaboration where you can grow and participate? How are the people seated? Are, are they segregated by floors or departments? Are they integrated? Literally, these are the cues that you can tell at a glance that show, demonstrate the values of the place that you're either working in, going to work in, or want to shape for your people to work in. Um, and how do they assign credit? This one is a really tricky one in our business, especially in this context of an award show where, where people are assigned credit. But um, even internally, like when somebody's having a great idea or they're on a, uh, on a hot streak, 
is this, is this about a person or a group of people? Is it about the boss who's saying, hey, I'm doing it right. Look, you guys got the formula, way to go. Um, is it about the name on the door? And then uh, another telltale sign for us when we went about shaping a new agency, um, how do you review work? Is it in the open? Does it happen in the corner office with your ACDs or your CDs? Um, are those review sessions a small number of people? Is it a big number of people? Um, because you can tell very quickly, just by observing those few simple things, w how much collaboration is valued. And again, not by way of like selling you our thing, but it has come to our attention through the people that we've hired, um, strategists, creatives, and others, that when we started the company, we, we started with sort of a designer approach to reviewing work. I mean, we did it completely different at Wyden. I'm sure everyone does it differently in their own places. What we did is we created this thing called the work wall. It runs the entire span of our building. And all the reviews happen there. There's even a little platform, a podium, that we had built on it so that the entire team is supposed to go up there. Now, you can't have everybody all at once because you do have to have specific roles and responsibilities. And it just honestly gets exhausting to have 20 people at the work wall for two hours reviewing work. But for the most part, this is how we do it. You can kind of see here how we sit. Um, it's, it's about uh, all the groups are uh, intermixed. You've got strategists next to uh, writers, next to uh, digital producer or uh, programmer. And then everyone gathers around the work wall when it's time to go through a pass. Um, and that kind of fosters this open collaborative culture where people don't feel um, as though they can't participate in it. We have this kind of motto that when it's on your computer, it's yours. When it's on the wall, it's ours. And, um, and the other part of that motto is it doesn't mean shit till it's on the wall. <laughs> so, you know, that's just a couple things that we've instituted that we've seen measurable uh, change in terms of the way people collaborate to create. Um, so the next value we wanted to identify is about um, generosity. Um, you know, it's, it's a couple people when we went around and talked about who's mentoring you, who's teaching you, who, who, who are you going to learn from. And um, that is a very important orientation at any stage of your career because, you, you know, one never stops learning um, in this or in life. But teaching, which is the other side of learning, is a generous act. It's important that um, there is a value system in place that thinks teaching is important. That comes from a, a, a generous place. Um, this allows people to explore their own ideas. It um, lets people find their own voice and allows for space for individuality. Uh, and it also has a healthy relationship with failure. Um, if you don't fail, then at some point in your career with an idea, with an effort, then you are not trying hard enough. You are not taking enough risks. You are not going for the higher ground of what creativity can bring. Um, so it's important to understand what an organization's relationship to failure is because we're all achievers. If we're in a place where failure is beaten down and rejected and punished, we're probably not going to fail. And, and that's going to that's gonna lower the ceiling of what you're capable of in terms of your creative output. How you might see that. Um, do coworkers celebrate your success as their own? Um, that's, that's a really important part of what we try and do for each other as partners and as people in our culture is like, if someone fails, you gather around them. You don't capitalize on that failure for your own self advancement. If anyone sniffs that, you're probably going to be fed upon and excommunicated. <laughs> um, but if you help people, then you know, your, your stake in the joint goes up. Um, you know, do they want for you what you want for yourself is good measure for that. Um, you know, like one thing is that when, we, when we're interviewed by other people or we're interviewing people for a job, a great question is ask who's grown the most last year in our culture. Like I'm always, I love to get that question 
and I love to talk about like who are the people that we've really invested in. Some of them are turnaround stories that are just amazing. Like you know, um, I can't go into specifics, but there are people that have been on the skids just about ready to to leave the place, and we'll sit down and we'll work out a strategy for getting that person back. It might be partnering them with the right person, but spend the time to do that. And if you're entering a culture that values that, you'll hear the stories from the people in it. Uh, sharing and giving credit, and what's the approach to training and reviews? Like those are just very s simple questions. But you know, look, what, my favorite thing that I learned from Dan White, and while I had the opportunity to work there, was uh, you're no good to me until you fuck up three times. And my partner Glenn and I fucked up twice to the point of almost getting fired. It was really close, but we improved by such leaps and bounds just with those simple learnings and, and um, really seeing the, you know, seeing down at the precipice is like, okay, uh, that was a bad one and we're not making that mistake again. And just, you know, I really love being allowed to do that and I hope that all the other cultures out there that you guys are in um, foster that kind of environment as well. Um, there's different dimensions of generosity and one of them is, uh, is kind of a creating a, a really unique um, environment, both within the agency and outside of it. And uh, one of our missions is to unleash creativ creativity for ourselves, um, our families, and our community. This is a piece of artwork from a uh, art show that we uh, just instituted. The Gallery at 72 is a series of art shows that we do to benefit the community. And uh, in this case, who was it, Matt? The, or Jess, who's it was? Huh? Hitotsuki, two artists from Japan who we had come over um, after the tsunami and we did a fundraising benefit selling their artwork. Um, it helped a lot of people just because you can imagine in Japan the, the, sale, of, or the sale of art was probably not the biggest priority after that event. Um, and so proceeds from this went both to the artists and the art community and to people in need. All right. Um, Courage, you know, we're, we're kind of courage junkies, which you're, you'll pick up on, and uh, so we have a strong bias. Um, as creative people, you should be wired for courage. That's probably the, you know, the drug of creativity runs fastest and is most satisfying when you're on the edge. And um, so you're, you're probably inclined for that, um, but you need an organization that stands behind you in that because there's nothing, um, less satisfying or probably damaging for your career if you are a uh, brave person in a fearful organization. That is the, um, that's a short, happy life that you will, you, you, you will lead um, in your career. So, you know, do you look at the work of your company or the ones that you want to go to and say, how the hell could they do that? How'd they get away with that? If, if you do, that's probably a good indication that that's a great place for you to be uh, nourished and to really push boundaries. Um, you know, we, we only bring one idea to a pitch. I'm not saying that's the right way or the wrong way. Um, it's, it's been good for us <laughs> because uh, we're harder on ourselves about is this thing really going to solve the client problem. Now, just because we present one idea and maybe even win a large piece of business as a result of going in with that kind of clarity, dedication, and bravery, uh, it doesn't mean that that's what ends up getting produced. C point number one, collaboration. <laughs> that's with our clients as well. We'll, we'll build and, and amend ideas with them once we're working together. But um, we just don't believe in, in going in with a smattering of stuff. It's, it's not brave and it's not really a useful way to spend time, we don't think. But, um, and have you ever resigned a piece of business for creative or cultural differences? I know a lot of people talk about like resigning a piece of business for creative differences. Uh, yes, we have, and I'm sure you guys have as well. Um, the the softer measure is these cultural differences. Like when when you start getting into an abusive relationship, um, that it, you know you're being treated um, not respectfully, or your culture is reacting in a way that is unfamiliar to you as a leader or or participant in the culture, it's you're acting angry all the time or tired. 
Um, it's time to reconsider whether or not that's a healthy piece of business for the company and you as an individual. Anything to add on that? No. So this is a, uh, uh, a campaign that we um, <laughs> did for K-Swiss. It ran mainly in the United States. The, I think the ultimately the tagline was K-Motherfucking Swiss. So on the list of things that were, uh, uh, th th that's a case of a great cultural fit of a client that's actually maybe braver than we were, that kind of kept pushing the envelope. There aren't enough of those in the world, um, and they've been a great client. But um, it is just, you know, our, our intent here is to give some pretty, tactical ways that you can kick the tires on, on an organization that you're looking at. All right, um, so accountability. Um, one of the dangers of being at the kind of called the early third of your career is getting into a situation where, where you are not being con held accountable for your output or your work, that you're kind of just part of a system that's feeding ideas and moving things forward, but ultimately there's not a sense of ownership that's expected of you um, by your company. And um, this business fundamentally rewards people who have a sense of ownership and who hold themselves accountable. So as self-starters, the fact that you're here right now indicates that you're self-starters. You're probably wired for this somewhat, but you know, urge you to consider whether your organization really looks at you in, through that same light. Um, because if you attach yourself to the outcome, whether it's you're an account planner or an art director or an account person, when you attach yourself to outcomes, that's when the outcomes tend to get better. And those are where the rewards of our industry tend to follow. So people talk about not getting placed in boxes, not being labeled certain things. This is where it really, comes to, not your function, but what are you actually making from an outcome standpoint? So um, one first thing is like, you know, does the culture that you're in embrace metrics? Do they even set them? Um, you know, coming from a really strong creative culture throughout my life, I used to be, just get the heebie-jeebies when people would say, look, we're gonna have a data and analytics set after this thing and we gotta move the needle on these five metrics and yada, 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 and I just go, bullshit, man, just make it great, it'll be famous. Um, I've grown up since then and I think for the better and I think this, is, this has done a lot of things for our youngest people. Um, we've got a young writer who, who was, uh, he's, he was working on that Kenny Powers thing, which is, really about, I mean, that is a creatively indulgent piece of work. But when I hear him talk about it and how it's moving sales and sell through at retail, I'm inspired, man. I mean, that is a kid who's, who knows that he's attached his ego to more than doing one great ad. He's attached his entire ego to the client's success, a long-term relationship, you know, th that's crazy for a 22-year-old kid to just have that kind of awareness, and that's because we set these, these metrics. Um, and, and what are the ultimate wins? Are they awards, you know, money, uh, revenue for the agency, long-term relationships, happy clients? Just good questions to have the answers to. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you're thinking about joining a new organization at some point, asking questions about what their compensation structure is, is a great window into what their values are and how they really think. Um, that's not an inappropriate question to ask. And it's one that will, you know, it's easy to talk about, hey, well, these are our values, X, Y, and Z. And then when you kind of peel the onion a little bit, reveal that, that maybe the things they talk about aren't the things that they're doing. Um, and values are aspirational. No one lives their values 100% every day. Um, but understanding compensation is important particularly because there's so much variance now in how companies are compensated. You know, the kind of old school model of there's only one way to get paid in this business has been completely blown up and it's gonna continue to blow up over the next five years. So understanding what the organization opts into and believes in and is willing to do is gonna shed insight into who they really are. Oh, I thought that was interesting. I just chucked that one in there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, in terms of the metrics side of things, it's probably the most, most interesting place to play, and that is social media. Um, 
we manage the Facebook communities and the social media strategies for a lot of our clients. And that's where you can get real time, um, you can understand the real time impact of your efforts. So, so while there are some things that you do that are, can't be measured and that's okay, uh, we have to embrace the fact that we do things, that, that there are some things that are impossible to measure, that's part of the art. There are increasingly better tools and so organizations do have the ability, if they value that, to opt in to uh, a more measured world and, and which actually we believe expands the creative opportunities, doesn't limit them. Yeah. So, I mean, that was another cool example of, you know, creative people assi signing up to create like a huge uh, increase in like Facebook fans, coupon redemption, pretty boring, but you know, like when they hit 26%, everybody lights up, you know. Um, Lastly. Lastly, um, ambition. Um, you know, it, it is important to understand what your personal ambitions are and where you want to go and align yourself with an organization that has the same ambitions. It's, it's, there are a lot of agencies out there um, that are happy being small and, and and there are other agencies that would never want to take on a risky piece of business because there's not enough money to it or maybe wouldn't invest in a certain area because that's provocative or exciting or, or, or being on the vanguard. There are varying levels of ambition um, within agencies and there are varying levels of ambition within people who work in advertising. So uh, this isn't an endorsement to go to a certain type of ambition. It's just um, an encouragement to consider your level of ambition and doesn't match with the organization. If you are mismatched in either way, it's going to be a very bad relationship. You should want for the agency what you want for yourself because um, inevitably there are going to be a lot of decisions that made that are going to affect how, how much you can exercise your ambition. So, I mean, how many people are really clear on what their agency aspires to? There you are. What does your agency aspire to? Aspire? Aspire to. What does it want to do? What's it ambitious about? We become really international during five years uh, to get at least one million US as a profit, net profit, and to get at least one uh, golden lion during five years. Okay. I think Very it's fair clear. to say that, that those are ambitious goals. Yeah. Very clear. Um, but sometimes they're going to be defined differently. So like, do, do you want your work to be famous in culture? Some people weigh that more heavily than they do. I could have 10 gold lions this year. I don't give a shit. I just want to be famous in culture. In what culture? Or yeah. I want to be the most profitable agency in the world. And that's what we're going to be all about. And we're going to align against that. You know, mm -hmm. and we're not saying that there's like a right or wrong reason here. Uh, we're just encouraging you to consider it and examine it because it's something that often goes um, unconsidered in, in, in the process. What is your ambition? Um, to this year, well, one year, three year, and five year. <laughs> this year, open um, a successful Amsterdam office. Um, make it uh, self uh, or uh, break even by the end of the year. Um, continue to grow our existing business. Support our culture. Train our staff and create, long-term, the next generation of leaders for our industry. I kind of bolt them all together there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and also just another interesting thing that we, we were talking about is, it's interesting, a lot of agencies tend to attract um, ambitious clients when they are themselves seemingly ambitious and on a growth jag. So we identified this thing as like, maybe it's a good thing to look around and see if your client list includes a lot of challenger brands. They tend to cluster around challenger agencies that tend to be the most ambitious of their kind. Yeah. And then another thing just to listen for, I think, is, um, you know, um, it's very easy to talk about what you're doing well when you're kind of sussing someone out, when you're interviewing, when you're asking your questions. Um, you should listen for th people talking about things that they don't do well. Um, there are, um, that's going to be a sign of someone who, just like you, is working on yourself and trying to grow and trying to be better. You want to be a part of an organization that kind of has that same ethic as, as they're going about things. So um, it's just another thing to, to, to listen for.
Um, so, you know, those are the five values that we recommend you consider. We've also tried to give you a list of, of 12 or 13 of um, what could be some of the most frustrating questions you could ask in an interview process. Um, <laughs> but one that, that whoever's across from the table you will say, damn, this person is really considered. They're really thinking about this. And, um, and you know, the other half of this equation is knowing yourself and knowing what you're looking for. This isn't a one-size-fits-all business, um, but it is one that rewards people who are good fits in their culture um, because for as great as you are and as hard as you work, um, the energy either as a headwind or a tailwind um, that the culture will give you will be the difference maker in the tra trajectory of your culture, of, of your career. So look, we want to have a conversation now about this and see if this has you know, sparked anything um, with you guys. One, one question that we got before we started that I just thought I'd kick off with is, do you guys think it's possible to change a culture? Uh, let's say from one that you don't see that it's very courageous to a more courageous culture. Do you think that that's possible? Anyone? Long but possible. Can you think of any examples of when that's really been done well? Yeah, over, over years it did happen. That's good. Great. It's very rare that you, you, you know, you, I think the media likes to play up the ones that are supposed to be turnaround stories that aren't. Um, but, you know, you have to believe and optimistically approach that kind of change. The NBA yeah. as a brand? As a brand yeah. How? Yeah, no, I think you, I think that you've got some. Yeah, it's, I agree with you. They have really changed that brand. Um, our our orientation on this would be about what's it like to work at the NBA, and whether you're a player or. And then they may have made those changes at that level too, um, but certainly their external facing thing is a good example of it. Yeah. Right. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of like, you know, our, our industry though, I mean, one of the things that we, why we wanted to talk to you guys about this is what we see, and I don't know what your experience is, is, um, is there enough dedication in our industry to creating the next generation of leaders in it? Or have we in some ways become a talent extraction business where um, people come into cultures, uh, especially agency cultures. Um, we know we all work hard, but what kind of commitment is there to creating this next generation of people? Because our industry needs it now more than it ever has. We're, we're in crisis, and I'm sure you'll hear that, this in all the other um, conversations around here, is you know, clients are ahead of us as an industry. Clients are pushing us to do things that we don't know how to do yet. They're asking for us to behave in ways that are new. And um, my feeling is, and this is just an opinion that I want to provoke some reaction to, that our industry is very slow to change because we have not committed to raising people and growing them to the next level of talent. Huh? Well, there may not be enough that have a positive manifestation of it. I think there are plenty that are exhibiting a lot of fear because they don't know what to do and they can't find the resource in an agency to do it. I mean, there's a few really great examples of, you know, what's, what's happening right now when the Unilevers of the world start turning, you know, 
uh, selling soap and, and stuff like that into a, a really active part of our culture. That's exciting. It means that they're demanding more from our industry to, to uh, face this new sort of opportunity. Um, yeah, but you know, I, I do think that we're a little slow on building the people that are going to do it, which is why what I'm seeing is more and more stuff going into uh, clients. Clients are taking a lot of their stuff inside that they can't get their agencies up to speed on. So are there any, any questions about this or any other comments? Yeah. We, yeah, we, we do. We, we've got a couple things in, in that nature. Um, uh, we started a, um, a school, first of all, called 72U, um, whose mission, not surprisingly, is to raise brave and generous people. Um, so that's a, an 11-month program that's starting in July. And we have two full-time uh, headmasters for that. One is a... Um, kind of renowned creative director. The other one is a great strategy director. Um, and it's about the, the marriage of strategy and creativity. So there's that. And um, we also have kind of a vibrant internship program. Uh, but, you know, I, I think the thing that we, um, quite frankly, are, are, is a priority for us, um, and it's part of a recognition of what's going on, is a greater emphasis on, on, on training on a, on a day in, day out basis. Because the formality of these programs is good, it's a commitment, and, um, but ultimately it's, you know, as an organization, you know, what we've realized is that um, we've attracted some of the world's best people, and um, for them to stay there and be vibrant and healthy and to kind of take their careers to the next level, um, they demand of us um, a certain growth plan and a certain pace of growth. And so as the management team of that, of, of the, which is a great place to be when you're the management team of a company and, and people are demanding more of you in that area, I think that's the ultimate impetus for, um, for doing it. Yeah, I think that I think that's a global phenomena, and it, it's because you know, that happens because of financial pressures, where you're trying to do more with less people because of the, the economic demands of the business. Um, so it, it's it's you know values are you learn you know when when the screws tighten a little bit, you learn what your values really are, and and you know we're encouraging our industry, and we're going to try to be leaders in that. Um, of realizing that that there is no great advertising, there is all the great work we see is a product of someone caring about someone's career at an early stage and bringing them along, and, and we want to be a leader in that. And, and taking it upon yourself to go through the hassle of providing that environment. I mean, you know, it's expensive to start this school, which is, yeah, you know, I'm glad that we get it as a, it's a nonprofit, so we got that status, thank God. But um, yeah, I mean, you do have to make an economic model that supports. Your your educational uh, desires and um, it's been really important for us and just you know for our values um, to be able to create this school because we didn't see the kind of talent being made out in the world that we needed as fast as we needed them. I mean we've we've been lucky enough to be a fast growing company that based itself on creating hybrid talent that wasn't isolated in their silos so that the creative people took uh, responsibility for good strategy. The strategists took responsibility for good client management. Um, everyone has their specialty, but that wasn't happening. Like we were hiring specialists from the industry who didn't know how to work collaboratively with other people and take joint accountability for the ultimate great strategic product if you're a creative. So we had to make the school. It, it was something that we had to do. Hopefully we'll be able to afford to continue it for a while. I'm just saying that's the way we're making people that we think work.
Mm -hmm. uh, Exactly. I mean, you, you, people don't teach behavior in school. They teach you how to make an ad or how to do a process or how to learn a skill. And so much of what is happening in modern media is about behavioral interaction, you know, and people are really watching that in really concrete ways. Our, our biggest growing department is community management. We, we uh, service our clients by being community managers, where we've got a guy or a girl all day doing uh, social media updates for PacSun or for Carl's Jr. And that's a behavior that is really happening out in the world, and you have to be, uh, be able to interact with your clients, with each other. It would be great, I think, if our industry could start teaching behavior as well as skill. I also, yeah, I, I, I agree with that, and I also, the irony is that if you look at modern culture, what are the rules of modern culture? Well, if it's about transparency. It's about real-time creation. It's about collaborating. It's about um, building one thing on top of the other without like a single owner. If you look at, those are the rules of social media, of the internet, et cetera. So certainly we as a human culture have demonstrated the ability to do that and, and what, what, where we think the opportunity is, is to take that, those values and that behavior and then apply it to a workplace where you're making marketing and you're making ideas on behalf of your clients. Well, thanks, you guys. Do There's you have one, one other yeah. question? Yeah. No, that's definitely true, but I think you got to do both. Or at least we couldn't recruit people fast enough to, to keep the thing growing well. Yeah. So we have a life coach on staff that's in charge of talent and culture, which for a company of our size, we're a, you know, a little bit shy of 150 people in LA. That's a, a big commitment um, to that type of thing. But in our hiring practices, uh, we often, in, in um, you know, when, when, when teams are drafting athletes for professional leagues, sometimes they want to go out and find a certain position to fill, and then other teams go out and find what they call the best athlete available. That, that might not exactly fit our need, but my gosh, this person is fast and strong and a great character person, and we're going to bring that person into the organization, even though that's not the exact perfect fit of what we're looking for. Um, those teams tend to be, in, in sports, tend to do much better over a long period of time, and we kind of look at that model um, in terms of finding the right people. Um, it is a, probably a little more organic than most agencies where people will come in the door, we won't have the exact position for them, or we'll create a position for them because we feel like they're going to be someone who can kind of walk in on day one and play by these rules, or these fit with them. It's, it's you know, we're, we're definitely not trying to make any value state, judgment statements here. We're just saying think about it and know the culture and fit the people in the culture. Is that it? Nothing else? I hope it's been somewhat useful. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the festival. Uh,